Hello everyone and welcome to Hashi Talks. Hope you're having a great day. So this talk is about HashiCorp Vault but beyond secrets management. So we all have seen HashiCorp Vault to be the effective solution when it comes down to secrets management. But have you ever considered that HashiCorp Vault is beyond secrets management? Let's see in this talk how enterprises can make use of Vault actually make them compliant yes that's right so we will look at HashiCorp vault and how it helps enterprises gain their compliances in the payment card industry so my name is Aditya Sharma I am a DevOps consultant at Arctic based out of Toronto Canada you can connect with me on LinkedIn as you can see my handle is on the screen I would love to say hi and chat with you so the agenda for this meeting is, as I mentioned, this talk is about Vault and compliance. So definitely both of them are going to be part of this talk. So I will take you through a bit of understanding around what PCI DSS compliance is. Don't worry about the full form of this. I'll explain it in the coming slide. Then what does compliance really mean for an organization? You know, we have to look through how and when the companies really focus on compliance and we will see what different teams, different personas within the organizations uh, are and how they perceive compliance. Then we will look at how Vault will do the compliance mapping for PCI 3 using Transit Engine and Transform Engine. Then we will look at how Vault will help in the PCI 7 compliance using different teams and different access to those teams. Then we will look at PCI 10 compliance, which is anything around the card information that is stored, it should be tracked as well. So we will look at PCI 10 compliance and how audit logs help in achieving them. So we are going to run through a scenario where organization is going to achieve PCI compliances and we will also demonstrate how Vault is going to help them achieve that. Okay. So what does PCI DSS compliant means? So PCI DSS means the payment card industry data security standard. So PCI DSS, it's a compliance that is valid for the organizations who are either storing the information, accepting the information or transmitting the credit card information. It's a continuous process across the enterprises, across the organizations where they assess the risks where they remediate that and they report it if a risk has to be captured in the audits and they maintain if that's running fine. So this is a continuous process and it is a set of some operational and technical standards that companies, especially payment industries, have to comply with. Now how are the enterprise requirements really coming for this compliance standards. Let's take an example, not looking at the compliances, but let's look at a journey where a company is going through an app modernization practice. So there are there is an organization who is running a legacy app and accepting payments uh, and running fine, but you know, not always things go as planned. So they have uh, you know, scalability issues and they are battling with response time. So, you know, the organization decides to do an app modernization, take an app modernization journey. So they go with the microservices architecture, implementing you know all the fancy buzzwords. They implement DevOps. They design the databases on the cloud. Uh, you know, setting up all the DRs, setting up the help and support processes a little better. But the most important is they are targeting the security to be in the design phase. And that's the most important aspect of it. Now, when the security is in the initial design phase of an app modernization journey, that's where the real story begins on the compliance. So the CIS, so the Chief Information Security Officer, generally puts the guidelines that they need to secure the payment data now. And there are different compliances that deal with it. Specifically in this, we will look at three compliances, PCI 3, which talks about securing the data of the consumers. PCI 7, which talks about giving only limited access. 
to the teams that are in really need of that. And third is PCI 10, where every transaction that's happening in the in the payment industry has to be tracked within that organization. So if you're pulling the data or putting the data into your database on the credit cards, something has to track it. And this organization has adopted Vault. You know, as I mentioned, it's a Vault and compliance thing. So definitely these two are in the picture and we will see now how HashiCorp Vault just beyond what it is capable of doing that secrets management, how it can really handle these three compliance requirements. So I'm excited for the talk and let's get moving. So let's look at the compliance requirements in a bit more detail. So what is PCI 3? As I mentioned, it is securing the credit card information. And when it is stored, you have to make it unreadable. So what does that mean? It means multiple teams will now have to make it work across an organization, right? So the first team is the DevOps. Uh, the DevOps team would be entitled to implement more of this strategy. So that means they will implement the encryption uh, on the credit card and that will be set up using HashiCorp Vault. And within Vault, they will also configure rules and policies so that different app teams can access the data, but with limited privileges. And the second is the application teams. Now application teams will be the one who will consume this data. So if this is encrypted, they will have to you know, decrypt that uh, and also put the logics to call different apps altogether and databases. So they will have to enable their apps to connect to all engine APIs. And the major concern around app in this ecosystem is they don't want the things to break. So when the encryption happens, the things break also. So that's the main concern. They want to deliver fast, but they don't want to break stuff. The third team, the, the second compliance is PCI 7. So in PCI 7, the cardholder data should be limited to different teams. What that means is your database admins, they have control over the databases. They should not be able to view the credit card information as is. It is essentially a point of data breach and companies have huge penalties when it comes down to any breaches. Second is the support team. Now, support is very critical in the payment industries. Things go wrong, the payments are reversed, you know, customer may have unauthorized activities, but any support that needs to happen, this team really needs access to the data. But do they really need the whole credit card information? Not really. So they need only the last four digits. So audit and the forensics teams need access to the whole clear data whenever any unauthorized activity happens. They need to track it and close it. Last, the audit and forensic team in PCI 10 compliance, they need to monitor and track access to the cardholder data, right? So anything that's going in the payment industry where any transaction is happening around cards, whether it is retrieving that information or putting the data back into the database, any transaction has to be tracked. And these are three compliance requirements. Let me summarize it up. I know these, these are not easy to kind of map. So let me summarize it for you. So as part of PCI 3, we need to encrypt the data. So payment services are going to send the credit card information to Vault. Vault will send encrypted or encoded information. So this is where PCI 3 compliance is being met. This data will be written to the database in the encrypted or encoded format. Now, PCI 7 comes in the picture. The PCI 7 says different teams should have different access rights to the data. So the DBAs will only see the encrypted information. The customer would like to see the as is information, which is the clear text. Help and support would like to see a masked data, only the last four digits. And audit and forensic would also like to see the clear text data. On top of that, PCI 10 says they also need audit logs. So this is all in all what PCI 3, PCI 7 and PCI 10 looks like from a compliance perspective. Let me just summarize it what I just said. So application teams would like to encrypt credit card information, but minimizing any impacts into the apps. Fraud detection team needs clear text information. Support team needs only last four digits. DBAs and app teams need only access to the data, but 
with an encrypted form. They should not be able to see the real data. And audit teams should be able to see the real clear text format because they need to trace back certain unauthorized activities, so they need access to this data. So having said that, these are all the compliance requirements that organization comes with. Uh, I explained how they basically came to these requirements and what each of these requirements really mean. Now, the first is PCI 3, the next is PCI 7 set, and the last is PCI 10. This is important because now we are actually going to go deep dive into the Vault ecosystem. Let's get started. So let's first look at how Vault achieves PCI 3 compliance. The problem is the cardholder data has to be protected. The solution is simple. Just encrypt the data when it is at transit or it, it is at rest. And what really helps in that is a Vault transit secrets engine. So this secret engine has encryption and decryption workflow. Let's just look at that, like how does it really work under the hood? So the payment service basically sends a request to encrypt API where Vault has different policies. This API is passed on with a clear text credit card information. What Vault does is it encrypts that data and return encrypted credit card numbers. This data is then pushed onto the database in the encrypted format. This is how the encryption workflow looks like in Transit Engine. The same thing is now the data is encrypted, but the apps need to decrypt it as well. So the decryption workflow is the reverse of what we saw. So the first thing is the payment service will send a request to the encrypted credit card information from the database. This encrypted form is then sent to Vault where it is a calling a decrypt API for decryption. Vault, based on the policies, will allow or disallow this call on the API. If it is accepted, it will send back the data back to the payment service in a decrypted clear text format. So now we have looked at the transit engine and how it works. Let's look at the demo. So we will be talking about the transit engine. Let's see what has been enabled. So there are no secret engines enabled right now. But we can enable them from the UI. As you can see, we have Transit, we have Transform, and other you know different secrets engine that we can enable. Transform is part of the ADP. Transit is not part of the ADP. I'll touch base on that. Now, in the secrets, we have seen there's nothing enabled. Access policies, they are all blank. So it's, it's like a blank enterprise board system. Let's look at how Transit Engine has been implemented. So there is a script where I have written all the commands and what it does. So the first step is we will enable the transit engine at a path. You can choose any path. Second, we will define an encryption key. Third, we will test how the encryption key works with the credit card information. We will pass that and we will take out the ciphertext and pass it into the decryption key. So this description key is where the cipher has been passed. Whatever has been encrypted is a cipher. Let's run it. So when we run it, you will see the first step is we have enabled a transit engine. Then we have created an encryption key at the path transit keys payments. This encryption key will be used to encrypt the data as we have passed and we have received that cipher text for that credit card information that we passed. And now we have called a decrypt API passing this credit card information and we have received it back. So what is stored in the database is encrypted ciphertext that you are looking at the screen. So the decrypted text, as you will see, is the same as we had passed for the credit card. So this is where the transit engine has encrypted and decrypted it. Let's look at it in the UI. So this is the transit engine that has been enabled. You will see there are two parameters, the keys, as I mentioned, we are creating a payment key. So we have created a payment key where you can see there are different options available. You can encrypt it, decrypt it, you have data key, VRAP, HMAC. We are not going in that depth, but I wanted to showcase that when you create a key in transit engine, there are multiple options that are available. The important point is the algorithm that is used for this encryption is AES-256. This is the version one. You can rotate the encryption key or edit the encryption keys as well. Now, moving on to the configuration of this engine, you will see it is enabled at the transit path and you can configure other parameters as needed. 
So this is about the transit secret engine. Let's read the configuration from the CLI as well. So you can read the, the key information that we just saw for more detailed information like what is the type of encryption key that is being used and a couple of other parameters uh, in order to configure it again. So this is about the demo. Let's, so we saw that, you know, transit engine can encrypt the data, but there are challenges with transit engine that are very important to solve. The major challenge is when we did the encryption, if you have noted, the credit card is of a, the ciphertext enabled for that credit card number is way long. It is not no longer a 16 characters. So that means the teams like databases, uh, they have to retune the database. They have to redesign the schemas. The other teams like analytics who are reading the data from the databases, they are impacted as well. So what that means is, though we need encryption, but we need to encrypt it by preserving the format of that. So, so that impact on the applications are minimal. So the solution to that is if we can use a transform secret engine. Now, transform secret engine is part of enterprise license. And on top of that, it is part of advanced data protection module. So we will look at that. So as we saw earlier, encryption and decryption workflow remains the same, but this is part of advanced data protection module. So on top of enterprise license, you have to pay for additional license, which is ADP. It is NIST certified format preserving encryption, which is called FPE. So if you remember in transit, we used a different algorithms. Here, we are using something called FPE, Format Preserving Encryption Algorithm, using FF3.1 FP algorithms. <clears throat> so it will encrypt the data, but it will preserve the format of the output, which is same as the input. And one more thing is, this also provides masking capabilities. That means if you have given a credit card number, it will mask any digits that you would like it to be. This is very critical when we are giving support teams access to only last four digits. <clears throat> so let's look at how we can implement that. Uh, so first, as we saw earlier, we have to enable the secrets engine. We have to now create a role, which is vault policies uh, and a transmit transformation and identifier. So transformation identifier, basically where we define what type of transformation we have to do. It can be FPE or masking, uh, what kind of template we have to use for value detection. What are the roles which are allowed to use this particular transformation? Let's look at the demo. So uh, let's look at the Vault UI. So as you have followed before, we have enabled a transit secret engine. You can enable from the UI, there is a transform secret engine available. But I think it's better if you can look at from the CLI perspective. So let's see uh, the script for transform. It's pretty similar. So we are enabling the transform secret engine. Then we are creating a role and the transformation identifier. We are creating a role so that we can attach the transformation now. Now, after the transformation has been attached, we are creating a transformation of type FPE. And this is a command to create it. So now we have an inbuilt template and allowed roles, which is payment that we just created. Now we are fetching the transformation role and we are encoding the data now. We are passing the credit card information for that transformation that we created and now we are encoding it. So if you see, we are passing that information, fetching whatever has been encoded and then finally decoding it into clear text as well. Let's see in action. So let me give the permissions. So let's run the transform script. So transform script has been executed so as you can see, the role has been, uh, secret engine has been enabled. A role has been created of type payments. We have created a transformation of type FP and allowed the role payments to be eligible. Reading it, we can see it's a type FPE and it is using a template and uh, allowed role. It is encoding the credit card number with text and it is decoding the, so the important point is it, it has encoded but different string is not there now and it has decoded into the right values as well looking at the ui so you will see there is a transform secret engine there is a transformation that we just created which is card number if you click on that it is of type fpe format preserving encryption 
and it is using a template of credit card number and a role called payments which is attached to that transformation so in the application you will use this role when you are running your Spring Boot apps it has two built-in templates but you can also create more templates there are different alphabets available that you can use within your transformation and then you can use see the configuration of that at a specific path so the most important is the transformation and the roles and how they both are kind of tied together that's the most important thing so this was the transformation engine so we implemented the encryption and now we can say that the organization is pci3 compliant so we basically protected the stored card holder data by encrypting it with pres without preserving the format we could have used transit secret engine but with preserving the format we could have used transform secret engine transform secret engine is part of the adp module as part of vault enterprise license so let's move forward i think we have covered quite a bit of ground already pci3 is done let's move to pci7 now so the pci7 states that we need to limit access to the data for specific team requirements. So what that means is the DBAs should only see the encrypted data. That's something which we have done already. But the support team should only be able to view the data for last four digits of credit card. For that, we will use the same transform secret engine but with masking capabilities. Let's look at that. So how do we implement the masking capabilities in transform engine? It's pretty similar. We enable the secret engine we create a role and a transformation identifier. We create a transformation by giving a different type now, which is masking. We can use a template for value detection. As you can see, there are some default templates, but you can also create a template. So I'm creating a template with a regex. We can pass it or we can use pre-built templates also. So we can use which masking characters to use and most importantly, which role to use. This role is used in the applications that you configure so spring boot apps would have application dot properties that would refer that way let's look at the demo so in this demo we will first look at the ui as we saw earlier transform engine has already been enabled we have just one transformation and one role there are pre-built templates and we can also create one there are pre-built alphabets that we saw now the most important thing as part of this is we are going to create different roles and different transformations and also new templates. So we are going to create new templates on top of that. So let's look at the, the CLI. So we have a script that does that. So the first step is we check if the transform secret engine is enabled, which is already done. So we will check if that is there. Then we will create a template. We didn't create a template last, but now we will create a template to mask and with providing a regex and alphabets there. Now, once that is done, we now attach it to the role. We create a new role for cust support because that team would be given this particular role for this uh, transformation. Then we create the transformation for masking the credit card numbers. We give type as masking. We give template that we just created in step two. Then we allow that role for customer support to only access this particular transformation and we pass masking character as S X. Now we write the transformation rule and finally we are encoding that. So whenever we part, pass the credit card information, it is encoded and send only the last four digits. Let's look at that. So as you can see, the transform engine is already enabled. We created a template called masked all last four card numbers. We created a role for customer support and we attached the transformation of type masking and added that role there. Now fetching it, you will see the allowed roles, the type of masking, the template that is being used. The most important is we pass the credit card information and it returned the masked characters. So this is how the masking would, based on how we provided the template, it will mask only the keep only the last four digit but mask all let's look at the ui so you can see there is a new transformation added called cust support and in that cust support you will see a transformation is linked uh, to a role which is a uh, masked card number so that is a transformation which is of type masking masking character is x and a template that is used for masked all last four card numbers and you will see that 
if we go back to the template now, a new template has been created, which we just did. So we provided a pattern on how it will pick up the characters and based on this template, it basically masked it. Looking at the configs, so this is the same transform engine, nothing new. So the most important is, you know, different transformations you can create and different roles you can create for your different teams and use that in your application properties in Spring Boot application, for example. So, having said that, I mean, we are already through with PCI 3 and now we are done with PCI 7 as well. Let's look at what we did. So, we we configured a limited access to the cardholder data to different teams now. So, the customer team only now looks at last four digits. And how we did that is using Transform Secrets Engine Master. Now, last, let's look at how Vault will do the PCI 10 compliance. So, PCI 10 compliance means you have to monitor and track all access to cardholder data. The solution is you will enable audit devices in Vault. So let's look at how we do that. So what is and how we implement Vault audit devices? So Vault audit devices, first thing is they basically enable you to capture your logs at any path and those logs can then be shipped to any of the log ingestion tools. So the first step is we enable audit device in Vault we send the logs to any platform of your choice. Let's take an example of Splunk. You can uh, also use a few things like Azure Sentinel or so on and so forth. There are different tools that can help in you know, processing that data. And finally, the data is there, but the, the teams have to identify patterns so that any breaches that happen are automatically detected and acted on. Let's see you know, a demo on how that works. So let's look at a script that is written to showcase what is done. So first we are enabling an audit device at a file path, which is writing the logs into vault audit.log in the same host where it is running. It's basically a container. Then uh, we are requesting a mask on credit card for the first support role that we just did. So we are encoding it and last four digits are only displayed. Then we look at the audit logs in that container where these logs are stored. We'll prep on encode. Then we look at the encryption of credit card using transit engine. So we enabled both. So let's look at how transit engine uh, has received a request and is it captured in the logs or not. So we are doing transform request and transit request and then we are seeing that if it is captured in the logs or not. Let's run this. So here it is. So if we see, you know, we enabled an audit device at path file. We send a request for masking the credit card number and it has sent back the response, masked it. Now, this is how the audit log works. So if you see any request that goes into vault is captured as a request and a response. So word of caution, we have used the policies as root. It is not advisable. Only for this demo I have done it. You have to respect the policies. Then you will see a response captured as well, where it captures the client token, accessor, and a request ID. So all this information, when it is passed into Splunk, will be captured along with the operations and the path that we have requested. Let's look at the next step, where we have encrypted our card number using Transit Engine in a cipher text. And now you will see the same thing, where we are capturing, you know, the request for transit and the client token policies are all captured here again you shouldn't use root policies so we have used you know transit engine the remote address and the response is captured as well and we will see that you know when this is passed the request response everything is passed into the Splunk database this can be leveraged into different dashboards and you know actions can be taken so that being said, PCI 10 compliance is achieved using Vault. So you are able to monitor, you know, and maintain audit logs for every transaction that is happening for your credit cards. In case of any authorized, unauthorized activity, this information is really useful for audit and forensic teams. All right, I think we are at the end of our talk. And so the talk was how, enter how Vault helps enterprises achieve PCI DSS compliance. So using Vault, we did PCI 3 compliance, we did PCI 7 compliance, and we did PCI 10 compliance. 
So that's the core view of this talk, that HashiCorp Vault is not just a secrets management system. It has many more capabilities and it caters to a lot more industries who deals in payment industry and that kind of covers every industry right now. So HashiCorp Vault is way beyond secrets management. I thank you for your time and I wish you a great rest of the day and I hope you got a got some learnings out of this talk and if you would like to connect with me my LinkedIn handy is right there I would love to say hi and chat further thank you so much